Hello there and welcome to Wake Up to the Bible. I'm Daniel Kaplan. I'm here with my father, Dr. Kaplan, and we're going through the books of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, over the course of this year. We're doing a little bit every day uh, based on the traditional readings. Today is the third reading of the week, and this is Genesis 19, 1 through 20, and we're going to be reading through the Robert Alter translation and then making some comments. And the two messengers came into Sodom at evening when Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And Lot saw, and he rose to greet them and bowed with his face to the ground. And he said, Oh, please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house to spend the night and bathe your feet, and you can set off early on your way. And they said, No, we will spend the night in the square. And he pressed them hard, and they turned aside to him and came into his house, and he baked them a feast and baked flatbread, and they ate. They had not yet lain down when the men of the city, the men of Sodom, drew around the house from lads to elders, every last man of them. And they called out to Lot and said, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And Lot went out to them at the entrance, closing the door behind him. And he said, Please, my brothers, do no harm. Look, I have two daughters who have known no man. Let me bring out them, them out to you and do to them whatever you want. Only to these men do nothing. For have they not come under the shadow of my room, roof beam? And they said, step aside. And they said, this person came as a sojourner and he sets himself up to judge. Now we'll do more harm to you than to them. And they pressed hard against the man Lot and moved forward to break down the door. And the men reached out their hands and drew Lot to them into the house and closed the door. And the men at the entrance of the house, they struck with blinding light from the smallest to the biggest, and they could not find the entrance. And the man, men said to Lot, Whom do you still have here, your sons and your daughters and whom, whom and whomever you have in the city, take out of the place, for we have about we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters, and he said, Rise, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. And he seemed to his sons-in-law to be joking. And as dawn was breaking, the messengers urged Lot, saying, Rise, take your wife and your two daughters who remain with you, lest you be wiped out in the punishment of the city. And he lingered, and the man seized his hand and his wife's hands and the hands of his two daughters and the Lord's compassion for him and led him outside the city. And as they were bringing them out, he said, Flee for your life! Don't look behind you and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Flee to the high country, lest you be wiped out. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lord, look, pray, your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown such great kindness in what you have done for me in saving my life. But I cannot flee to the high country, lest evil overtake me and I die. Here, pray, this town is nearby to escape there, and it is a small place. Let me flee there, for it is but a small place, and my life will be saved. So quite a harrowing account uh in comparison to what we've had up to this point this is one of the more i don't know epic sort of you know thrill packed sequences uh of scripture uh what comes to mind when you uh, look at this material uh did did we um okay no we haven't gotten to the 26th verse yet um let me say that uh as i as i said earlier um, some of you are picking this up maybe without hearing some of the earlier uh, reports. Uh, we'll go back and, and check them out, you know. And, uh, you know, are you enjoying this or enduring this? I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, but anyway, uh, we have here the baking of unleavened bread and the washing of feet. And, and so that, <laughs> that ties in with what this season would, would, would become in, in the future. Uh, I think, that, you know, that's, that's interesting. And uh, another thing that that strikes me is that uh, he 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 offers his daughters. There's a principle in the Middle East of hospitality. You see how Abraham uh, is so hospitable. You see how Lot is so hospitable, and he insists on bringing them into his home. That you know they say, well, we don't have to. You know, we can stay out here. I think as as we read the account, and they say, no, no, and so he says, no, you you know you need to come in, and so on, right? And um, mm -hmm. Right. Um, he insisted. Yeah, verse three. So anyway, this is very much a part of the tradition of the Middle East. It's part of Jewish tradition and, and Arab tradition, the concept of hospitality. But here it's carried to an extreme. 
in the sense that because they're his guests, uh, he, he offers his daughters in their place. But, and, and as Daniel was, was saying earlier, this shows the impact of the culture, <coughs> that, that, that this would be his, his answer. You know, it, it, it's, it's sad. Uh, we understand the pressure he was under, but it is really s still a tragedy that, that th this is, is, is the uh, way, way the matter would be handled to offer his daughters uh, rather than maybe trying to somehow, uh, I don't know, work, work something else out. Um, I'd also uh, like to mention that he says that they, they were virgins, but later on we see that their sons-in-law it may be that the commitment had been made. He, he could be dishonest, but it may be the commitment had been made, but the, the, the ceremony, uh, uh, a relationship not yet been solemnized. Maybe they were just about to, 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 to do it, uh, which is an interesting time to, to have to leave. And uh, the sons-in-law are the ones that ridicule and don't want to come, uh, you know, so it, it's really sad. They, they, they could have been spared. And, and you know, and evidently, then they could have you know lived on with with the daughters, and you wouldn't have had the same problem that you have later on in the chapter, if the sons-in-law had gone with them, but the sons-in-law chose to stay there. And I, I, as I said, it's possible that they were committed, but had not yet actually you know formally married. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Um, it's possible too. You could take a different take on it, and let's let's go another direction. <laughs> Why not? Um, and let's say that maybe they were in fact married, like ceremonial, right? But they had not physically come together, and perhaps there was actually some hangup going on in the family. I can't imagine why they would have any sort of traumatic feelings about sexual activity, considering what's going on in the town, right? You know what I mean? So perhaps this is actually speaking to an overreaction to the sin creating a vacuum in which it ends up getting worse later and i may be reading too much into it but if you just piece it together it's possible and and i just know that happens you know in the in the you know you go from the victorian era to the sweeping twice you know you like the pendulum in terms of sexual behavior tends to go one way or the other people generally don't find the balance uh one thing that i like about this um the way it's written is uh, the way that these men come in and they're like, you know, who are the men that came to you tonight? And uh, in many ways, you have this just animalistic mob, right? And they're asking about the men that are coming. And the men are not even men. They're divine. But in, uh, you know, they're they're uh, messengers, right? So, uh, but but yet they are behaving more like men than the, than the human men who are behaving this animalistical way. And then uh, it says, you know, that we may know them, which is obviously a sexual contest. But also, if you think about it, these are people that don't know God. So essentially, in a, in a roundabout way, they're indirectly asking for what they need, even though in their words, not in their it, it conceptually. I don't know if that makes sense. Not not in terms of the physical action. I think also Lot was concerned for the safety of the men. You know, when they said we'll stay, we'll stay the, on the open square. He insisted it was he was being hospitable, but at the same time. He was probably concerned for their for their safety. What's also interesting is that we see in the book of Hebrews that some people being hospitable have entertained angels unawares. Well, Lot evidently didn't at first know these people were angels. At some point, he would have understood that they were more than men. But it, it doesn't seem like that's initially what, what he understood. So he was, in effect, entertaining angels unawares, as the book of Hebrews talks about. And to some degree, you know, you can look at it from a, again, from a writing perspective or a narrative perspective that ultimately uh, Lot does pun get punished essentially for going the wrong direction in this way, even if it was out of, you know, protection, hospi ho hospitality, whatever it is, because uh, spoiler for tomorrow, I believe we're going to get there tomorrow. Uh, yeah, we'll get there tomorrow. Um, what happens to Lot is not something I doubt he would be very pleased with. So there is kind of a measure for measure uh, response to that in terms of, I don't want to call it karma, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I don't believe in karma, of course. Um, any other uh, thoughts that come to your mind when you are looking at this uh, account here? Well, we might comment further when we read the, the rest of the account.
Oh, I wanted to say one other thing, though. Uh, in, in the ancient Middle East, there was a custom of naming a book after the first a key word or phrase in the book. And so that's how the Jews referred to the various Hebrew books of the Bible, but also the portions, the weekly portions are given names. And if you have a Hebrew calendar, some of you may own them, you'll see that each week you'll see words, like for example, Genesis 12 uh, is called Lech Lecha, get thee out. You know, that's the uh, you know first major phrase in Genesis 12. And uh, then when you read the section on Noah, that, that's Parshat Noah. That's the portion called, you know, called Noah. And so uh, these these portions, as we read them, each of them has a, a name in Hebrew, and it's based on the, the first key word or phrase in the, in, the, uh, in the section. I thought that might be interesting to you, especially if you have calendars and, and lists of portions that would explain what that is. And for those of you who are looking that up because you want to know what we're going to read ahead, well, good for you. Your good research going on there. Because, <laughs> yes, you can follow along with us. We are following the traditional cycle. So if you find anything that's the that's the typical you know Jewish order of readings, well, you're probably going to be on the right track. And feel free to read ahead of us, comment, ask us questions about the uh, portion uh, if you want to do that. Or if you're catching up behind, that's okay too. Feel free to comment. We'll try to respond as we can if we get enough questions maybe we'll do a special uh episode answering questions that people have uh, uh entered over the course of the whole thing uh like subscribe hit the bell ring your friends uh offer them uh uh, offer them foot washing and unleavened bread if they come over to your house, maybe. Uh, whatever it takes to get people to listen uh, to this uh, podcast. Because we want a lot of people to read the law together. It's going to be so much fun. Otherwise, we will see you tomorrow.